Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I just wanted to thank all of you guys for spreading Potterless via word of mouth. February's been a very good month in terms of listenership for Potterless, and I can't find one particular piece of promotion on the internet or social media that has been really big, so I think that people are just telling their friends and family about Potterless, and for that, I wanted to say thank you. I also wanted to say thank you to our two newest Patreon supporters, Rita Yu and Christine. They have decided to pledge money to the podcast, and in return, they get bonus content, most recently. Recently, I put up a bonus episode where I did the Pottermore sorting quiz, and it was a very silly quiz, but don't worry guys, I got Gryffindor. All of the funds I'm getting from Patreon I'm putting right back into the podcast so I can do things like buy better microphones and such, and if pledging money in return for bonus content sounds like something that interests you, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless, and if not, no big deal. So without further ado, let's get into the next episode of Potterless, chapters 9 through 12 of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, starring former... Vine sensation, and when we recorded this, Vine was still alive, and we talk about it as if it's not dead. Ashley Strongarm. Hello, Internet. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Potterless, the story of a 24-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. We are here to resume our journey through the third book in the series, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and I'm honored to be joined by Vine's own Ashley Strongarm. Ashley, how's it going? Hello! It's going well. I'm ready to talk about Harry Potter. Good. I'm quite a big Potterhead. Perfect. So I want to You are in it. the right place. I say we get right to it because chapters 9 through 12 of Prisoner of Azkaban are juicy, and we have a lot to discuss. So chapter 9 is called Grim Defeat, and it starts right off with Dumbledore sending all the students to the Great Hall so that the teachers and stuff can search the castle, uh, you know, in search of Sirius Black, because when we left off at the big cliffhanger of chapter 8, it's at Sirius Black's in Hogwarts, which is terrifying. Right, this guy escapes from magical prison, Mm -hmm. and then he gets into a magical school. It's like the two places that you shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, you know, it's definitely just like, one dude and he's popping around, just chilling, writing stuff, tearing up pictures. So Dumbledore pulls a, he pulls a sleeping bag spell, which just makes a bunch of sleeping bags appear out of nowhere, which I think is very interesting that they have a particular spell just for this. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I so I, 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 I brought this up to someone that was like very into Harry Potter. And I was like, wait, I thought the whole thing is you can't just make things appear out of nowhere that they have to like go somewhere. And someone's like, oh, he must have made them teleport from somewhere else. So they just have a room. Like, I guess one of the storage rooms just has a bunch of sleeping bags in it. Right. Well, you know, maybe they just have, like, this big equipment room that just goes on for eternity. But if that were the case, don't you think it would just make so many other things convenient? They'd be like, well, just go get it from storage. We have this convenient (laughs) storage closet that never ends. It's full of, like... Thousands of sleeping bags. I mean, maybe it's a magical storage closet and then it yeah, just doesn't end. Wouldn't that just like solve all of the world's problems though? If they were just yeah. like, well, let's just provide everything for everyone. <laughs> let's just put endless food and solve world hunger. No, they don't do that. They just give people sleeping bags instead. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good use in case, you know, there's a murderer in the halls. So the kids are like trying to figure out how Sirius Black got in because, you know, there's Dementors. It's a castle that should be on lockdown. And Percy is being really lame and telling everyone to shush and be quiet. Percy's just the worst character. I don't know if he ever gets good later in the series, but I just don't I like him. <laughs> He's just, and his name is so accurate. You're like, oh, Percy. <laughs> it's, a, it's such like a nerdy, like annoying person name. I don't know if you ever watched Thomas what? the Tank Engine as a kid. Did you watch that show? No. Oh, okay. I watched, the face. I, Hell watched, no. I watched the crap out of Thomas the Tank Engine and I'm pretty sure like the annoying train was named Percy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the yeah. case. Well, it's just like the one kid that would like raise his hand in class and be like, Oh yeah. He'd be the kid. Yeah. Uh, Oh, Mrs. Johnson, you forgot to tank up last night's homework assignment. Yeah. 
That's Percy for sure. Is really <laughs> Snape thinks that it's an inside job, which further passes along my theory, which I relayed in a previous episode of this book, that the whole Peter Pettigrew thing, that Peter Pettigrew is guilty and is disguising himself as Scabbers. If I'm remembering properly, I might be wrong just because Peter Pettigrew kind of looks like a rat, but I think that's a thing. He does look like rat. So don't don't spoil it for me, but I think that's true. No, <laughs> so here's here's an issue that. I have, which is the next thing. Gryffindor okay. is supposed to play Slytherin in Quidditch, mm-hmm. but they say that at the last yeah. minute, the game gets switched to playing Hufflepuff because Malfoy's arm still hurts from his fake injury from the from Buckbeak. Right. So they switch Buckbeak. the schedule. But if you remember in the first book, they had to play the Quidditch finals, even though Harry was in the hospital in a coma for three days because he <laughs> defeated Voldemort. <laughs> And it was the finals, the most important game of the entire season, and they couldn't play Harry because he was, you know, sick and in a coma, but they played the game anyway. So Malfoy has a pretend injury, and they can switch the game? You're right. Like, you know what? That's a good uh, well, They're like, this kid's in a coma. That's not a big deal. But this kid <laughs> hurt an elbow. Shut it down. <laughs> like, this kid saved the world. We got to play this game. And you can't have a sub. Oh, this guy got, got pretend hurt from this from the bird thing that he messed up because he did the one thing you weren't supposed to do. Oh, no. Make him play Hufflepuff instead. <laughs> and let's try to execute the bird while we're at it. Let's make it. Right, yeah. Work. You learn that in the later chapters that they're like, you know what? We should murder this bird. <laughs> like, no. It's so absurd. I don't get how Malfoy has so much pull. It's so Well, sketchy. maybe it's his dad. You know, his yeah. dad's supposed to be like this guy that's high up in the ministry. Yeah, and he has really nice flowing is- blonde hair. Ugh, the worst. His highlights are beautiful. They're on point. You can't argue with him. Speaking of beautiful, this is the first time that Cedric Diggory is mentioned uh, because he's the captain of Hufflepuff, played by Robert Pattinson in mm-hmm. the movies. Uh, so he's gorgeous. All the girls are swooning over him, and every time they mention his name, they giggle and all kind of fun stuff like that. Snape uh, subs in for Professor Lupin because apparently Professor Lupin is super sick and Snape is a giant asshole when he teaches the class. Like he takes points away from Gryffindor for like arguing with him and he says that they're gonna like start talking about werewolves and then kids are raising their hands and they're like, uh, Snape, Professor Lupin said we're not supposed to learn about werewolves yet and he's like, oh, Professor Lupin's teaching you wrong and he's just being so obnoxious. I don't understand Snape. He's just the worst. This whole book is just like everything's aggravating all the time. It is a very stressful and angsty book but I like, I know Snape is supposed to be really good in the end. Like I know he's the whole like all ways thing and I know he's supposed to be really nice but I know I'm so I know a few things I don't know the context of it I think it's just because Snape has a huge crush on Harry's mom but I know he's supposed to be good but like when does he turn it around because for three books he's just been the worst and I keep giving him the benefit of the doubt but he's he's so awful it's gonna be forever Uh, I know it's gonna be like the last page of the sixth book uh, after he murders (laughs) Dumbledore You know, when I read this, though, my first thought was like, oh, it's so crazy that, like, the pictures move. And then I was like, oh, that's just kind of like when you're scrolling through Vine. There's just, like, yeah. a bunch of moving pictures. Yeah, it'd be like if we so, could frame Vines or GIFs, which I'm waiting for that technology. Yeah. So the Quidditch match starts, and it's raining like crazy. Like, it's crazy torrential downpour rain. Again, they can't cancel a Quidditch match for anything except for, you know, Malfoy's pretend okay. injury. So there's rain everywhere, and they call a timeout. Now, I've already had my grievances. I've, I've ranted about having timeouts in Quidditch in, I think, two or three episodes already. Because basically, you can, so you can call a timeout at any point in time in Quidditch. So why don't you just call a timeout right before the other team catches the snitch? Right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> this is quickly yeah, turning into like, an anti Quidditch okay. podcast. Like, it shouldn't be called Potterless. It should be called Fuck Quidditch. It should be called Quit It Quidditch. Oh Get my it? goodness. That? That's great. Quit yeah. It. Oh, I'm going to write a book after this when this podcast becomes world renowned and it'll be called Quit It Quidditch and it'll just be 30 million pages about why it's the worst sport. So, anyway, they call a timeout, which is bullshit. And then Hermione comes onto the field, which is also bullshit. And then oh, yeah. she does the impervious spell to Harry's glasses. So the only reason Harry was having trouble seeing the Seeker is because there was rain in his glasses and they were like fogging up and stuff. So she does the impervious thing, which makes them waterproof. Now, this raises a million questions for me. First off, 
<laughs> first off, why didn't they do this before the game? Second, <laughs> yeah, <there you laughs> they knew it was really rainy and it was like being ominous about how bad the weather was the whole day. So first off, why didn't they do this before the game? Second, why didn't she impervious everyone on the team and every article of clothing? Like all of their robes, all of their hair, their gloves, their brooms, like everything should be impervious. They should be completely rainproof, not just Harry's glasses. <laughs> That's a really good point. And also, like, yes, maybe his glasses won't have rain in them, but his glasses are not, like, glued flush against his face. Like, he's still going to get rain, like, in between his face and the glasses. And honestly, how are they staying on his face? Right? He's Why isn't he wearing rec specs? Like, he needs goggles. Like, he needs (laughs) goggles because he's flying. He's literally flying. They're in the wizard world. He needs wizard contacts or someone just fix his eyes. Yeah. Like, there's a spell to make sleeping bags appear out of nowhere, but there's not a, oh, I don't need glasses anymore spell. It's so silly. It's just. Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, here's your good vision. <laughs> that, that's what the name of the spell should be. Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, here's your good vision. Who needs LASIK? I don't know why we're muggles. <laughs> Maybe because we're making fun of the wizards. Anyway, the Dementors come and they ruin the game. They just come and they're like, oh, there's a lot of people. And then they come to Harry <laughs> and they make him pass out. And then they keep playing the game. <laughs> Even though a kid passed out 50 feet up in the air and just, like, fell to his almost death. They're like, no, keep playing. It's Quidditch. And catch the snitch. Can't catch it. Come on, Harry. What are you doing? The giant oh, scary thing that thing eats that people's scary. souls. <laughs> yeah, first of all, there's nothing to stop these, like, soul suckers from just flying into the match. Yeah, aren't they supposed to be giant? Like, couldn't someone from the crowd be like, oh, no, a bunch of Dementors are going to ruin the game. Like, expect Patronum. <laughs> like, why did no one do yeah, that. Like, hey, let's, yeah, okay. You know, the more we talk, the angrier I get. Because I saw no of them was I was just like, oh no, look out, Harry. But first of all, you've got a crowd of people who all have wands. Yes. Like, not one or two people could be like, it's fine, guys. I'll do the Patronus. <laughs> like, literally, that's what we do here. We're a bunch of wizards. Yeah. And then you're right. If a kid falls down that high up, you think they'd be like, at least one of us should call a timeout. Yeah. Anybody. Or like there should be nets like to catch these kids. The other thing to keep in mind is that they are not professional athletes. Harry's 13 years old. Like imagine (laughs) playing like, I don't know if you played any sports growing up, but like imagine you at your ability when you were 13 in anything. Like when I played basketball when I was 13, I was garbage. Like I couldn't make any shot past the foul line. Like I couldn't make left-handed layup consistently like if I'm 13 years old and I'm flying on a broom and I've only played this game for three years like Harry's only known this game has existed for three years <laughs> like think of doing anything that you've only done for three years and then oh if you mess up you'll fall 50 feet to your death what I'm learning is I think maybe this all just means wizards are just super careless we don't care if you fall we won't have a timeout we won't even move our wands if a Dementor is coming or a whole group of them it's absurd so Gryffindor loses the game, Harry goes to the hospital wing again and Madame Pomfrey makes some sort of like uh, you again comment, which is great. I love Madame Pomfrey. Big fan of Madame Pomfrey and her sassiness. Dumbledore gets upset that the game was ruined by the Dementors. Dumbledore already hates Dementors a ton and he's like, oh great, now you ruined Quidditch too? The only sport at this school? (laughs) So he's upset. And then the worst part, and this is how the chapter ends, is that someone's like, oh Harry, by the way, your broom like got swept away in the wind and went into the Whomping Willow and the Whomping Willow beat the shit out of your broom and then Hermione like dumps all of the pieces of the broom onto Harry's bed. Like the only thing he <laughs> loves That was an world. unnecessary addition. Yeah, really like, like, do you really need to be like, here the remnants, cry some more. Here's your shattered dreams. Let's <laughs> lay them on your hospital bed for you. Uh, like for Chris- you couldn't have just waited to tell him when he was out of the infirmary. Yeah, like, hey, I know you just lost the game. I know you're in a lot of pain. I know you're in the hospital wing and Madame Pomfrey's gonna kick all of us out so you can be alone. But also, your favorite and most prized possession is broken into a million pieces by that tree Here, that almost at- murdered you <laughs> twice. <laughs> and there's only one murderous tree. Yeah. In any book. Yeah, why don't they teach this tree to only fight bad things? Like, why does it just attack anything? Why don't they just, like, poison it? Yeah, just get rid of it. I don't understand. Like, you have a tree that will murder anything that walks near it in a school of oh, children. Oh yeah. <laughs> this, they are so careless. You're right. Wizards are just the most careless human or not just, human maybe beings. Maybe they're so dumb. <laughs> this podcast is ruining me as a <laughs> I'm killing childhoods one episode at a time. 
think it is. Uh, and now we move on to chapter 10, the Marauder's Map, which oh. is great because it features Fred and George, the two best people in the series. No one can touch Fred and George. They're incredible. That's true. So Harry has to stay in the hospital wing for the entire weekend, and he's not going to tell anyone about the Grimm. That was something I forgot to mention is that while he was playing Quidditch, he saw, I think it was a cloud that was in the shape of the dog again. So he yeah. saw it again. So he doesn't want to tell anyone because he knows that everybody's going to freak out. Now he's seen the Grimm twice. There was the bus thing and now the Quidditch thing. And then he got freaked out when he saw it on the cover of the book in the bookstore. So now Harry's kind of spooked out because of that. Right. He's also worried about why he is the only person that faints when Dementors come. Like everyone else gets freaked out and they're scared and the room gets really cold. But Harry's the only person that faints. And he feels self-conscious about that because he's a 13-year-old boy. Like, it makes sense. Right. Middle school is like when you're dealing with so many issues. Oh. I just hate for one of them to be like, how come I'm the only one who passes out when demons <laughs> come in the room? Uh, and why does everyone make fun of me for it? Because they're demons. <laughs> because Give a demon a- try to suck your soul out of your mouth. Give them a break. But yeah, he's 13 years old. That would be seventh grade. I don't know about you, but seventh grade was the worst year of my life. Hands oh down. My God. By yeah. far. Oh, yeah. The kids were so mean. Oh, so mean. And that's when you start learning about, like, popularity and stuff. Like, that's when people start having parties and just not inviting the whole glass. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm not cool. That's true. <laughs> you're like, oh, no. That's when, like, the hierarchy begins. Yeah, that's when clicks start coming. And that was a bad time for me because I was like, I like everyone. It's like, oh, not everyone likes me. Well, imagine being that age with that kind of stress. And then also everybody has death sticks. Yeah, and and, and I can kill you with this if I want to. And the scariest, the scariest being in the world wants you to die all the time, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just rough. So now that the match is over, Malfoy takes off his bandage and is like, "Oh, I'm perfectly feeling better now." And he's roaming through the halls, making fun of Harry and imitating him fainting for the Dementors again. These are giant, cloaked, like skeleton-looking things, and Harry faints. Like, I think it's a totally reasonable thing for Harry to faint about. Like, they sound so you know, scary. I hope I faint. Yeah, like way better than dying which totally should happen. I don't know. Malfoy's the worst bully and everyone like supports him and thinks he's funny, but like all his jokes are awful. All he does is like make fun of Ron for being poor and Harry for fighting Satan all the time. I don't get it. How people laugh at him. I feel like all the things he does, like in a normal school, people are like, Malfoy, shut up. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's a really good point too. Yeah. You know, so. And who decided to like him? No. Like, oh, I'm going to make fun of this kid for surviving when like, A giant bald snake man killed his family. (laughs) Yeah, he's making fun of an orphan. Malfoy often makes fun of someone whose parents were murdered. Like, I think Harry has it going tough enough. Don't pick on the kid who doesn't have parents at age 13. Yeah, and even in, like, seventh grade, you'd know, like, that's fucked up. Yeah. Hey, Hey, dude, don't make fun of that kid. Yeah, tone it down a little bit. Like, he's been through a lot. He's fought Voldemort twice and won twice. Anyway, Ron, (laughs) while this is happening, Ron throws a crocodile heart at Malfoy in the middle of Snape's class, which is amazing. Amazing. So good. Ron is really, like, Ron's stock is rising fast in this movie. Ron's been great. Or in this book. Ron has really been pushing it. Snape takes away 50 points from Gryffindor, which is ridiculous. The point removal system in this school doesn't make any sense. That's like the one thing you should structure. Yeah. See, they're careless. Uh, so they're, they are. They're so careless. Is because the point system? Uh, it doesn't make any sense because 50 points was also the same amount that Hermione and Harry lost for like sneaking out after hours and sending a dragon illegally off the top of a tower. Like they lost 50 points each for that. And then now Ron like throws something in class and hits Malfoy in the face and loses 50 points. Like, come on. This podcast is making me so stressed. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry if you liked Harry Potter before, because now you're going to fucking hit. You're going to read all the rest of the books and be like, this is so dumb. Thank God I didn't get my letter from my owl. So Ron has a great quote. And like the next time that they're going to class, he says, if Snape is teaching defense against the dark arts next week, I'm skiving off, which is the British way of saying (laughs) skipping class, which is so much better. That's like when they say snogging instead of like kissing. Uh, I hate it. Snogging doesn't sound pleasant. Future books, you're gonna read that a lot. Oh, I think. good. Yeah. And when Harry starts like, snogging, snogging, when he starts snogging Cho Chang, uh, really looking forward to yeah. it. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
So they go to Defense Against the Dark Arts class, and Lupin is back, which is nice, because he's the best. But he apparently looks, like, still really sick with whatever ominous sickness he has. So he asked the class, like, oh, how was it when Snape taught? And everyone's like, Snape was the worst. (laughs) So he cancels the homework assignment that Snape made them do, which was an essay. Hermione gets mad because she already wrote it, which is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. (laughs) And then after class, Lupin tells Harry to stay after. So he talks to him about the Quidditch match, which is really nice. Like, Lupin looking out for Harry is the coolest. I really like Lupin so much. He's the greatest teacher at this school. So he's talking to him. He's like, hey, like, what's going on? And Harry right away brings up. He's like, so why am I the only one that faints when the Dementors come? Why is it just me? I don't get this. And Lupin says, because no one has as dark of a past as you which is super deep and and like, it's so sad and like super real. It's like, yo, no one's been through more shit than you have Harry Potter, which is like, woof. You've got to admit that's like such a good write in. Like J.K. Rowling nails it with long hair because you're just like, oh my God. I think everything, yeah, like everything she's done with Lupin has made me really like more respect J.K. Rowling. He's just like a perfect character and all of his quotes, like everything he says in his mentor role for Harry is so powerful. I really Mm -hmm. like Lupin a lot. He's easily becoming one of my favorite characters besides Fred and George because you can't, you can't top them. (laughs) So So Lupin says that they came to the match because they're just like hungry for souls or to, you know, take the happiness from people and they need to feast. And because they've been in the school with no prisoners to mess with, they're like getting really antsy. So when a bunch of people got together to watch Quidditch and a bunch of people were really happy, they kind of came to suck that happiness. So just an unfortunate thing that the way that it's like set up is that it's just going to screw Harry over and over again. Lupin says that he's going to teach him an anti-dementor spell, which is Expecto Patronum. I'm really excited. I've been waiting for this moment because I know Expecto Patronum <laughs> is dope and I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, did you do the, uh, the Pottermore Patronus quiz? That came out. Okay, so after we finish recording this episode, we'll do the little quiz and see what our Patronuses are. Because I didn't do it either. What do you think your Patronus is going to be? I'll I'll go with my answer, what I always said for spirit animal in college. I always said a Jack Russell Terrier because it's like a really hyperactive dog that just like wants to play with everyone and like lick faces and stuff. And I always thought that connected with me really well. (laughs) <laughs> but you don't, I don't all the time. <laughs> I don't know if if that uh, is a Patronus option. What about you? What do you think yours will be? Well, I am going to kind of go the same answer, not with a dog, but with like, you know, the kind of birds that when you're eating, you look down and they're like, these like fat little birds that hop around and they like pick at like French fries yes. that fell down. Yeah. Oh, that's so mean. No, that's super good. That's definitely an Ashley strong arm animal for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, Whitney like decided what our spirit animals were. That's so and mine good. was like a little hoppy bird. Great, super accurate. I really, um, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Lupin says that uh, that the spell is really complicated though. So he's like, oh, we're not going to have enough time to do it. And Christmas break is coming around. So let's do it after Christmas. And right. Harry's like, great, that sounds fine. So apparently you learn that Ravenclaw beat the crap out of Hufflepuff. So Gryffindor is still in the running, but they have to win every game the rest of the season in order to win the cup, which is painfully convenient. <laughs> Just the whole Quidditch is just, it's not a sport. It's just like drama. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so frustrating. It's like unnecessary pressure to put on kids of that age. It's so absurd. It's the only sport in the whole school. Like you better be good at Quidditch. Otherwise you're not playing sports. Yeah. Like the more I think about it, the more I'm like, these kids are way too young to experience <clears throat> any of this. Like a normal person would have so many panic attacks. Oh, with everything at the school. Yeah. Oh, there's a giant snake that's killing people. Cool. Yeah. Let me just take my finals. Yeah. <laughs> Class isn't canceled. But for some reason, the soul-sucking demons are back. Yeah. Get out of that. Don't worry. They're keeping you guys safe. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Don't be alarmed if they try to kill you, but they're probably... (laughs) They're they're here for your safety. Speaking of safety, Ron and Hermione say that they're going to stay at Hogwarts over Christmas break to keep Harry company, which is awesome. Like, total cool move by the two of them to, like, forego seeing their family to make sure that their best friend is safe. Ron and Hermione Mm -hmm. are just great friends. Also, Christmas at Hogwarts is just dope. Like, every time they describe Christmas at Hogwarts, it seems like the coolest thing ever. Like, you get to hang out with all the teachers. You get awesome feasts. It's really pretty. They're, like, what's not to love? Yeah, why wouldn't you stay? Yeah, I would totally stay. I'd be like, Mom, Dad, I'll see you on summer vacation when I'm not allowed to stay at Hogwarts. I'm staying. Anything that offers free food, like, I'm going to be there. Yeah, I'm there in a heartbeat. (laughs) I'll be too. 
classes in Hogwarts if I could. Yeah, for sure. So then people uh, leave for Hogsmeade. There's like a Christmas run for Hogsmeade. Harry can't go. But before everyone leave, Fred and George are like, hey, Harry, we want to give you a gift. And he's like, okay. And it's a blank parchment, which I'm assuming at this point in time when I wrote the note, like I was like, oh, this has to be the Marauders map, which is the chapter. Right. And like, this is the part where they reveal why the, t- the title of the chapter is the Marauders map. And Harry's like, okay, very funny, guys. It's a blank piece of paper. And he's like, no, 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 no. We stole this from Filch's confiscated drawer and all you got to do is say I solemnly swear that I am up to no good and then it works so he says it and then a bunch of ink shows up and basically it's a map that tells you where all the professors are located and all of the secret passages in Hogwarts so that you can sneak around and be mischievous. I love it. So good. And I love that quote. <laughs> yeah I say, solemnly you know, swear that I'm up to no good. Like, I'm already in. I don't even care if it does. Yeah, it could have been like a blank piece of paper that didn't do anything, but just the fact that they're like, oh, but you got to say I saw him. Like, that quote is so good. Uh, Like, people have things. I've seen, like, Harry Potter fanatics with coffee mugs that say always or different quotes from right. from the book or whatever. If I was going to get anything, I would get something that says, I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. Like, that should be on a shot glass, right? Oh, it should definitely be on a shot glass. And we should have those shot glasses. And I should sell them on Potterlist.com that I haven't made a website domain yet. Perfect. I'll do now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if that becomes a thing, I'll definitely... That's... Oh, that would be so good. Anyway, they tell Harry that there's seven secret passageways that lead to Hogsmeade, which is awesome. And he's... And they're like, yo, Filch knows about four. Two of them are blocked off. So there's only one. And it leads it leads into the cellar of Honeydukes, which is the candy shop. So all you got to do, go through this thing. And then when you get on the other side, say mischief managed. And then all the ink is going to go away. And it's going to be a blank piece of paper again, which is super sweet. Super sweet. So Mr. Who would you want to follow around if you had a Marauders oh, map? Who would I follow around? Oh, man. Yeah. You get to stalk someone. So I'm guessing it's got to be a teacher. I feel like Dumbledore would be too high profile. Oh, Madam Hooch, the flying teacher. She seems super cool. I feel like oh, I'd follow yeah. Hooch around and just kind of see what shenanigans she gets into. Gotta follow Hooch. Is that who you'd pick or who would you pick someone else? I think I'd pro- uh, follow Professor Trelawney because I'd be like, this girl does like mad drugs in her spare time. Oh, yeah. Like, she's... I want to know like, what she's doing. <laughs> she's doing all the wizard drugs. She's doing so many wizard drugs. and like, so I would many. just want to know what she does. Wizard weed, wizard blow, all the good stuff. <laughs> oh man mr weasley apparently had warned against stuff like this uh to the boys he was like don't trust anything that thinks if you can't see its brain uh which is just some weird ominous thing and i don't know if that's going to come into effect later but i hope it doesn't because this map sounds dope i really hope it doesn't like come to bite harry in the butt later but Harry yeah. decides to take the advice and follows the map and gets into Honeydukes. And apparently there's just candy everywhere, like candy for days. The book describes six or seven candies that are all like sweet or chocolatey or whatever. But the last one that they describe is my favorite. It's uh, like breath mints that also floss your teeth. Like that's got to be the <laughs> coolest thing ever. Are you kidding me? That's your favorite thing? Like think about it. Flossing is the worst and no one likes doing it. But if you're like about to go out on a date or something, or you're, you know, about to get dinner with someone, you just pop in one of those and then A, your breath smells good and B, you don't have anything in your teeth and you're going to be like so healthy. I think that's the coolest thing is it's like it's candy that does a job. Like it flosses so that you don't have to. I think that's amazing. Yeah, okay, that's pretty convenient. But I feel like if I was going to buy one thing in there, I wouldn't be like, hell yeah, somebody's going to floss my teeth for me. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, Yeah, I guess I'm just really lazy, so for me that just appeals to me. It's like, oh, I don't have to do something? Tight. (laughs) So They really have it, like, too easy. Yeah, they are wizards, man, the worst. So Harry sees the squad in Honey Dukes, and he goes up to them and he's like, yeah, what's up? And they're like, oh my God, Harry, you're not supposed to be here. And they raise the concern. They're like, wait a second, a secret passageway. That must be how Sirius Black got in. And then Harry's like, what? No way. And then they look around and see a bunch of signs that are like, look out for Sirius Black in uh, in, Di- in Hogsmeade. <laughs> like, and they're like, oh no, he totally did this. <laughs> that is definitely how he got in for sure. And we'll find out later which of the seven it is. But it's got to be one of those. It all sounds probably. Oh, yeah, 100%. So then they decide to go to three broomsticks, and they get hot butter beer. And they're like, this is great. This is so much fun. And then four teachers walk in, which is the classic, like, you know, if you skip school and then you run to your teachers. It's the same thing, except Harry is, you know, 
sneaking away from being grounded because he might die. Right. <laughs> so they hide Harry under the table. And then the teachers have an awfully specific and awfully <laughs> convenient conversation about the entire history of Sirius Black. Like super thorough, super well thought out. Very much like, oh, I don't know, a narrator in a book describing someone's backstory. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you're right. They're like, let's go to this public like bar pub. Yeah. And talk about from start to finish his entire life. Yeah. In public. They're in public, in a very public place, and they're talking about a very secretive thing about someone who murders people and not a lot of people know his backstory. And then like multiple times they keep saying things like, as you know, Sirius Black was James Potter's best friend. It's like, why are you announcing this to a group of people that know as the you're same well thing? Aware, yeah. <laughs> man. Uh, and then halfway through they're like, uh, it would be so bad if Harry heard about this. <laughs> and he's right there. <laughs> uh, it was just like this painfully <laughs> It would be super convenient if Harry was under the table right now, guys. Anyways, Can you imagine if he snuck out from one of the seven <laughs> secret passageways? Ugh. Oh uh, so basically, from this awfully convenient conversation, you learn that Sirius Black was super tight with James Potter. You learn that uh, Black and Potter were effectively like the Fred and George of their heyday. And then you also learn that Black was the freaking best man at James Potter's wedding and is Harry's godfather, which is an awesome it's plot twist. Them all. This is an amazing plot twist. Like there have been some twists in the book that have been pretty solid. Like the whole Tom Riddle journal thing is a pretty good one. And I knew from the movie that Sirius Black is actually a good guy, but I didn't realize he was freaking Harry's godfather and Harry Potter. Potter's dad's best friend. What oh, a yeah. what a freaking twist, man! Oh. What savageness is that? Yes. What shade <laughs> he has thrown murdering <laughs> his friend? <laughs> oh man, so good, so good. So you also learn that he was the person that knew about Harry's parents hiding when they did the they did some spell that basically puts them in hiding, and only one person knows where they actually are. And as long as that person doesn't tell anyone, like, they're completely safe and no one would see them, like, even if they're in the same room as them. Yes, again, another convenient spell yeah. that's just too convenient. <laughs> Everything is very convenient. Apparently, you know, what they're saying is that Voldemort either got Sirius to tell him or Sirius was evil the whole time. Basically, Voldemort got it out of Sirius Black where they were. And then now that, that he told them, the spell was broken, so he went to their house and then killed them. So Sirius Black sounds like a serious douchebag. Uh, he does. But here's here's what, what I think happens, and, and you get into it. So you learn that not only did Black kill those 13 people when he was like getting chased by the cops, but he also killed, in quotation marks, killed a wizard named Peter Pettigrew, who, quote, tried to stop him by attacking him. So this furthers my theory. Pettigrew is evil and he is Voldemort's assistant. And he used Polyjuice Potion to look like Sirius Black and then do the killing and then get chased by the cops and stuff. They said that he killed Pettigrew and all that was left was his finger, but I'm pretty sure he had to like chop off his finger in order to do this and like leave a trail of evidence. I think that's what happened, but I'm not sure, but that's my guess. I'm really thinking it's the Polyjuice thing. Don't tell me, I'm gonna learn, but I'm really- I won't tell you. Good, I'm glad. That's why. So you also learn that the mo the flying motorcycle that Hagrid used to deliver Harry to the Dursleys was Sirius Black's, and that Sirius originally wanted to like take care of Harry, which means one of two things. So it's either the real Sirius Black wanted to take care of Harry and keep him safe, or Pettigrew evil mode disguised as Sirius Black wanted to take Harry to then murder him. But either way, probably a smart decision by Dumbledore to be like, no. We're giving him to the Dursleys. So yeah. Just another little sketch and thing thrown in the mix. There's just so much you could do as a wizard. I know. So much you could fuck up as a wizard. Yeah. Just what? turn yourself into a different person yeah. and then commit crimes as another person or get someone to trust you and change shapes or, like, be a rat. <laughs> I would have so much trust issues if I was a wizard. Like, I'd be like, are you, oh, Ron? Yeah. Are you Ron or are you someone disguised as Ron? How do I know you're Ron? Like, it'd be terrible. We'd be so paranoid. <clears throat> All the time. I'd have to have, like, safe words for all my friends. Like, everyone would have to have a password. Like, I'd have to say celery, and they'd have to be, like, peanut butter. And I'd be like, okay, cool, you're really wrong. Oh, yeah, and then if they're like, what are you talking about? You'd like, be like, fuck, you're somebody else. 
<laughs> and then you <laughs> expect to patron on them. I just kill everybody. Yeah, ah, the Vada Kedavra, blah, blah, blah. So Cornelius Fudge says that the other weird thing about Sirius Black is that when he was in Azkaban, he was super normal uh, and wasn't like freaking out and in this weird state of shock like everyone else in. So that's a little suspect, which, you know, mm-hmm. I don't really know what to make of that. So yeah. Harry, Hermione, and Ron are basically super freaked out that they're learning about this and all this stuff and Harry's kind of freaking out. Another thing that was just strange about this whole conversation is that the teachers that rolled in were Professor McGonagall, Hagrid, and Professor Flitwick. And then Cornelius Fudge was already there and then he joined them. And then Madame Rose Murta, who is the manager of Three Broomsticks, came over. What did she do to be named Madame if she's just like the owner of a bar? Yeah. What a <laughs> fancy title. Yeah. Like, oh, it's Madame Rose Murta. Madame Rose Murta. Oh, <laughs> yeah, what do you do? Oh, I own three broomsticks. Wait, what? Gay <laughs> uh, yeah, sound. Oh, cool. Classy <laughs> Very classy <laughs> bar. Okay, chapter 11, the Firebolt, which makes me excited because the Firebolt is the dopest name for a broom ever. And when I started reading this, I was like, I really hope Harry gets the Firebolt. And then he does. Harry is super angsty at the beginning of this chapter. Like, the first instance of true Harry Potter angsty rage. And I hope that there is so much more to come. Uh, oh, he, there's so much more. He basically just... He's going to be oh. phase. He's looking in the panic at the disco. Yes. <laughs> so he's basically saying, like, oh, I hope Sirius Black dies. I hope that he gets caught and tortured. And, blah. like, he's going all out of control. And Ron and Hermione are kind of, like, trying to get him to tone it down. They're like, yo, like, calm it down, angst, Harry. Like... Let's just be, let's just chill. So they try to like take his mind off it. And Ron's like, oh, like, why don't we go see Hagrid? We haven't seen Hagrid in a while. And he's like, yeah, I can ask him why he lied to me my whole life. And then he's like, God damn it. This is not what I wanted. So, of course. Yeah, exactly. Angsty Harry's just out of control. So they go to see Hagrid. But it turns out Hagrid's like sobbing his eyes out. Because though he was found to be innocent with the whole Malfoy Buckbeak biting incident, Lucius Malfoy lobbied that they put Buckbeak himself on trial under the like the Ministry of Magical Creatures or whatever to see if they need to like murder this bird griffin or not. This hippogriff. Like they're gonna put a freaking bird on trial. That poor bird. Yeah. It's like you did the one thing you're not supposed to do. The bird bit you. Yeah. You pretended to get injured. Why would you chop the bird's head off for that? There's yeah, there's one rule of of hippogriffs, which is like don't shit talk them. And then Malfoy shit talked him. Like, this is Malfoy's fault. You can't murder this bird. I really hope they don't kill Buckbeak because he's innocent. Ugh, so bad. So Buckbeak is going to be under trial, thanks to Lucius. And if he's found guilty, he's dead. So the squad is like, hey, we'll research trials in which the creature won. And then Hagrid's like, okay, that sounds good. So they go to the library, and then they all start reading books, and they're like, oh, fuck. None have ever been innocent, ever. Literally none of them. <laughs> Every animal. It just has so much luck. Every guilty, every single animal is just guilty. They're like, ah, shit. And they just quickly forget about this. Like, the next two chapters, they just don't bring it up. They're like, ah, whatever. <laughs> Guess Buckbeak is dead. So it's Christmas, and yeah, Harry Daddy gets... Daddy's yeah, Merry Christmas! Bye, Buckbeak. Yeah, so it's Christmas. Harry gets another Weasley sweater, which is great. <laughs> I want a Weasley sweater so bad. I really want a maroon one with a big W on it. I think that would be great. He gets, like, uh, a Weasley sweater and some candy and stuff, and then he gets a motherfucker fucking firebolt with no name on it so he has no idea who he got it from but he's got a fucking firebolt mystery person like the coolest thing you can get yeah as a wizard at that age is the firebolt yeah it's like basically i I don't even know what to compare that to i think it's like getting a super fancy car yeah but from just an anonymous person yeah just like here's your tesla from no one happy christmas (laughs) and then naturally you're like Am I safe to drive this? Yeah. Well, Hermione thinks that. Ron and Harry are like, nah. So that's what happens next. Uh, He's a smart woman. Yeah. So basically, Hermione comes in and she's like, what? What? How'd you get that? He's like, I don't know. And Ron at first thinks it's from Dumbledore. He's like, he gave you the, the invisibility cloak. And he's like, yeah, but that was from my dad. And he's like, what about Lupin? He's like, why would Lupin give me a freaking firebolt while he has like raggedy rags and he's this, you know, sc- like old man. And he's like, yeah, but when Lupin said he was sick, I was in the hospital wing for detention and he wasn't there. So it's like, ooh, what was he doing? Dun, dun, so gosh. I don't know if that's going to come up later, but it could just be like a little red herring thing that might turn out to be true in the end. But basically, Hermione comes in, she's got Crookshanks, and she's like, oh, wait, but that's like such an expensive broom. This is kind of sketchy. And Ron and Harry are like, yeah, but who cares? But then Crookshanks 
attack Scabbers again because Scabbers is Peter Pettigrew. And you, you learn that Scabbers is like really skinny and looks really sick and is losing a bunch of fur and stuff. So, you know, sketchiness continues to build around Scabbers. Sure, that's like a pretty good hint they're dropping about mm, something. Something's up. So it's now Christmas something's dinner. Scabbers. Yeah, something's up with Scabbers for sure. So it's now Christmas dinner. And the few kids that are left, you know, at dinner with the teachers. And there's 12 of them total. So there's 12 people about to eat. And then Professor Trelawney, my least favorite professor ever, comes in. Previous episode, I ranted on her because she's just so, like, obnoxiously over the top with her dramatics, with the prophesizing of things. And clearly it's the the wizard drugs kicking in. The whiz weed. The whiz weed, man. So she comes in and she's like, oh no, I can't join you guys. I'd be the 13th person. And then the first person to leave the table would die. Professor McGonagall. (laughs) This is easily the best McGonagall scene ever because McGonagall immediately is just like, we'll risk it. Come sit with us. Like just not putting up with her bullshit. So Trelawney then asks, oh, where's Lupin? And Dumbledore's like, oh, unfortunately he's sick and he had to miss the meal. And McGonagall's like, yeah, Trelawney, you already knew that though, right? And raises her eyebrows, which is just so (laughs) good. So suspect. So sassy. It's amazing. I just love the like, like egging her on. And then Trelawney's like, oh, Oh, uh, uh, yeah, of course I knew that. I just, uh, I just don't like to parade around that I'm psychic. I pretend to not know stuff all the time to not make people feel uncomfortable. And then McGonagall replies with, oh, that explains a lot, which is like, oh, so good. So sassy. She's like, so sassy. Low key throwing so much shade at Trelawney. Oh, she throws shade everywhere. It's so amazing. It's like, so absolutely incredible. Like, oh, that explains a lot. Yeah. Oh. oh. So freaking good. So Ron and Harry then leave after dinner and Hermione's like, oh, I'm going to talk to McGonagall real quick. So Ron and Harry just go to the common room of Gryffindor and just stare at the firebolt in admiration. They're just like, oh my God, this is the prettiest broom in the whole world. (laughs) This is so pretty and it's all yours. (laughs) So then Hermione comes in with McGonagall. Uh, and McGonagall's like, so Hermione told me about this firebolt. And Harry and Ron are like, God fucking damn it. This bitch. <laughs> this snitching little bitch. Basically, McGonagall's like, yo, we're going to have to take this and inspect it because it might have jinxes. And it's going to take weeks. And Harry's like, are you kidding me? And she's like, yo, real talk. You got this from someone that you don't know who. And it's really suspect. Like, I should probably make sure this thing isn't going to murder you. And at that point, it's like, you know what? Good move by Hermione. Because that's super suspect to be like, here's and the like, nicest thing ever. He already almost died so many times. You'd think he'd be like more understanding. Like, I get it. People definitely want me dead. But instead, they're like, screw you, Hermione. Yeah. <laughs> this is like Hermione, the voice of reason. I forgot to mention this earlier, but when they were when they were trying to guess who it was, my initial thought was like, yo, what if Sirius Black, when he broke in, like dropped this off and found a way. And that's immediately what McGonagall thinks. She's like, yo, I think Sirius Black gave this to you. And it's like, oh, so we'll have to see. We'll have to see. I, that is my inkling is that it was Sirius Black, but I have no clue of how or why it would be him. But regardless, Harry's got a fireball now, which is super dope. Let's not go over the semantics. He's got the best broom in the world. So now we get into chapter 12, the final chapter that we're going to be discussing today, the Patronus. Finally, Harry's going to learn about Expecto Patronum, which makes me so happy. Harry and Ron are convinced that nothing's wrong with the Firebolt. And that, to me, means that there has to totally be something wrong with the Firebolt. Because every time Harry and Ron agree about something, they're wrong. Every That's single time. true. And Hermione is just always right, you yeah. know? She, re- she is like this little know-it-all for a reason. Yeah. She's been right about everything except for thinking that Malfoy was the heir to Slytherin during that book. But other than that, she's been, like, spot oh, yeah, on about that, everything. Uh, what house do you think you would be in? Oh, I've done the, the Potterless quiz, uh, and I think... Or the Pottermore quiz, and uh, I think that I would be in Gryffindor. That's what I got, and I think it makes sense. Like, I'm not humble enough to be in Hufflepuff. What about you? What no, do you I think th- you would be? I used to think that I'd be in Hufflepuff, but now I'm starting to think maybe Ravenclaw, because, like, I'm not a dumb person, you know? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm pretty, like, motivated. Sure. But I also, like, Hufflepuff seems so chill. Like, their name sounds like Huff and Puff, yeah, like you like know, they're, they're all just stoners. Back. All stoners. Yeah. So I guess I'm 
well then. I think, yeah, I think you could be Those one. Those kids. I also could see you as, like, one of the nicer, like, more reserved Gryffindors. I could see oh, you, yeah. you in that role for sure. Not a Slytherin, though. I don't no. think I could. No. I don't you're think I you're could. way too nice to be a Slytherin. Ron tells Oliver Wood about the, the Firebolt thing. And Wood is like, holy shit, you got a Firebolt? We're going to win a million games. And they're like, yeah, but it's being checked for jinxes. And he's like, no way. There's no way that Sirius Black could go and buy it for you. He's been running from the cops. So they're like, oh, you know, touche, good point. Harry goes up to Professor Lupin, and he reminds him about the promise to teach him the anti-dementor spell. And he's like, oh, yeah, let's do it like this Thursday night. So Thursday night rolls around. They go into an empty classroom, the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom, and he brings in a Boggart. He's like, well, I couldn't bring in a real Dementor, so I'll bring in this Boggart. It's going to turn into a Dementor because that's what you're the most afraid of. Super smart move by Lupin. Oh, yeah. So, Just a closet full of things that <laughs> scare the shit out of kids. <laughs> oh, man. So careless. The Patronus, you learn, is a guardian. It's basically an anti-dementor, and it's a projection of hope and happiness and the desire to survive. And you have to focus on a single happy memory, and then it will come from your broom when you say the curse or the spell aloud, Expecto Patronum. Harry decides that his first happy memory that he's going to use is the first time he rode on a broomstick when he flew away and caught Neville's uh, Remember-All from Malfoy and, like, all the kids were really impressed. A good a good memory, for sure. Um, oh, yeah. So they try the Boggart, and they try the thing, and it doesn't work. He, like, passes out and faints or whatever, and he tells Lupin, he's like, yo, every time this happens, I hear my mom screaming before she dies, and this time it was, like, super intense, which is, like, that's got to be, like, the scariest thing ever. Like, I can't imagine being 13 years old and this being like the third time that I've heard my mom screaming for her life. Yeah. Like what the fuck? I should have laughed. Like it's not funny. That's horrible. It's ridiculous. Like that's a, for a 13 year old human being. Are you kidding me? Like for you to get to the point where you're like, Oh, I heard my mom screaming again. <laughs> like, uh, I got to go through this again. Like, no, no one should ever have to do that ever. Like, no times. Zero times. One time. one time is too many. Lupin is like, yo, let's try let's try another spell. And he's like, okay. Or another memory. So he's like, all right, I'm going to try I'm gonna try the one we won the house cup. Again, it doesn't work. But this time he heard his dad telling Lily to run away and that he'll stay and fight off Voldemort. So you learn that Lupin, or not Lupin, that, uh, that Harry's dad basically sacrificed his life, which is awesome. Like James Potter being a real bro here. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. James Potter, super bro. So you try again. He's like, all right, you got to do something that's like super happy, really intense. He's like, all right, I'm going to do the first time when I learned I was a wizard and I get to go away from the Dursleys. And it works kind of like he gets a Patronus to come out of his wand, but it's just like cloudy and silvery. Doesn't really become the full shape that it's supposed to be. A weak stream. (laughs) Of Patronus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a semi, a semi Patronus. It's like, ah, you, you tried. It fends off his feeling of fainting and it kind of keeps the Dementor at bay. But then Lupin has to kind of step in to make it fully go away. And when he steps in front of the Bogart, again, you get the uh, the silvery orb that shows up. Like Lupin's greatest fear is whatever the silvery orb is. And I have no freaking idea what this is, but I'm really excited because it seems super freaking ominous. Like a... Oh, that's so ominous. Just an orb. A nondescript silvery orb. Like, yo, that's got to be some deep shit. I'm really looking forward to figuring out whatever the hell that is. Lupin's like, good job. Let's call it a night. You've already fainted twice and heard your mother screaming for her life. Here's a bunch of chocolate to make you feel better. And let's do it next week. (laughs) Little kid. Uh, it's like, good job. All right. Next week, you'll hear your mother die a couple more times. Yay. Eat more chocolate. Uh, yeah, have, no, have a chocolate. It's really good. Harry Potter's homework situation is getting super intense because of Quidditch practice like every day because it's the end of the season and having Patronus stuff once a week. He basically has one night where he can do homework. And Hermione is like going crazy from all the classes that she has. And she hasn't missed a single class, even though she has some at the same time. So you don't know what that is. And I've said this in previous episodes, but I my crazy theory is that she's doing some spell where she can like appear in multiple places at once and it's really stressful, but I have no idea. I'm I'm sure we'll learn at the end of the book what this is. Oh yeah. Like something's going on. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's, it's something sketch. Wood comes back and he's like, yo, I talked to McGonagall to try to get the firebolt from you. She got really mad at me because she said, what if Harry falls off the broom? And I told her I wouldn't care as long as he caught the snitch first. And she got really pissed. Like, I love <laughs> Oliver Wood's dedication to Quidditch is great. And he even goes on. He's yeah. like, what? It's not like I said anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we win, right? Yeah. Like, it's okay. I love his win-at-all-costs mentality. It's so good. He's great. Uh, so Wood is like, yo, Harry, you should probably order a new broom because it doesn't seem like you're going to get this broom back. He's like, why don't you get a Nimbus 2001? And Harry's like, no, that's the broom Malfoy uses, which is like the dumbest reason to not get a broom. Like, it's so dumb. He's so petty. His yeah. little rivalry. It's like, yo, it's the best broom on the market that isn't the Firebolt. You should get it. Ugh. So kids, kids, because they're in seventh grade, <laughs> they don't know. They shouldn't yeah. even be making these decisions yet. That's true. Anyway, Patronus practice ends up not going well either because every time Harry does it, it's just like this silvery thing and it's not the shape. But Lupin's like, Yo, you're 13 years old and you just learned this last week. You're way leaps and bounds above people, so don't worry about it. So it drains Harry a ton of his energy to do it and to make it like keep the Dementor at bay. They're saying, like, You know, we can't do this like too much. So so Lupin is like, you know what? You've done a lot this week. Let's celebrate with a butterbeer. And Harry's like, oh, I love butterbeer. And Lupin's like, what? You can't have had butterbeer. You've never been to Hogsmeade before. And Harry's like, oh, uh, 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 Ron and Hermione uh, brought me some back. And Lupin totally knows he's lying. <laughs> yeah, he messed up. Yep. And, but Lupin messed doesn't up, care because Lupin's a boss. So yeah, he's the coolest. He's like that one cool teacher that would be like, let's go get a butterbeer. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. Like, even though it's not alcoholic, like it's still like the same equivalence level of your teacher being like, yo, let's, let's pound some beers together. Like it's that equivalent, which is just great. It's like, Hey kid, let's go get like a soda. Yeah. <laughs> but at a pub, like a cool pub. You'll drink it out of a beer glass, but it'll be a Shirley temple. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'll get you like a cool soda. A yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they just start talking and Harry's like, why, why do they have hoods? And what ha- like, what's under the hood? And Lupin's like, oh, well, what they can do is they can lower their hood and use their last resort weapon, which is the Dementor's Kiss. And Harry's like, what's that? And Lupin tells him that they do it to people that they want to destroy really badly. And they basically take off their hood and then use their mouth-like feature to suck the soul out of a human being. <laughs> Like, first of all, the fact that it's a mouth-like feature. Super creepy. It's not even a mouth. Yeah. It's just, like, a mouth-like feature. That's, yeah. like, the worst thing I've ever heard. Some <laughs> yeah. kind of, like, awful hole in a head. My first thought is, like, the the little, like, stomach thing that pops out, like an alien. Like, the weird, like, mouth thing that, like, pops out of people's stomachs. Like, I'm imagining that, like, popping out and, like, sucking your soul from your yes. mouth. <laughs> yeah. I'm just imagining some just awful gaping thing. It's just, like, a soul vacuum. Ugh, God, so gross. Harry immediately regrets asking this. He's like, oh my God, that's terrible. Because Lupin goes on, he's like, yeah, so your brain and your heart still work, but you have no memory, you have no sense of self, and it's impossible to recover from it. Oh my God. (laughs) And Harry's like, holy shit, that sounds horrible. And he's like, yeah, the Ministry of of Magic just gave permission for them to do it to Sirius Black if they catch him. And it's like, oh my God. (laughs) It's just so terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. But Harry, in his rage, is like, you know what? Sirius Black deserves it. And Lupin's like, what? You really think that? And Harry can't tell him that he knows about all the Sirius Black stuff. So he's like, oh, you know, maybe. I'm sure he did some bad stuff. So after that, uh, McGonagall comes up to Harry and is like, yo, we checked the firebolt for literally every single hex in the freaking world and there's nothing. So here you go. Oh, by the way, Go win some Quidditch matches. Uh, do it. Go fight win, Harry. Mm-hmm. Sorry that you're, everyone wants to kill you. Go <laughs> win some Win, Win the sport. He tells Wood, and Wood is like super hyped. He's like, oh, good. Ravenclaw's only using clean sweep sevens. We're going to kill them. Uh, the name disparity in brooms is very extreme. Like Nimbus 2000, awesome name. Firebolt, killer name. Clean sweep clean. seven. <laughs> Ugh. That's just a literal broomstick. Like, I feel like I yeah. could buy a clean sweep 
from a marketplace near me right yeah. now. Like you get like Swiffer's new line of whatever is going to be like, oh, the Swiffer clean sweep gets and all the grime dude, off your floors. I would respect Swiffer so much for coming out with a clean sweep <laughs> as like a tiny nod to Harry Potter. Yo, they should do that. Swiffer sponsor. <laughs> yeah, We're always looking for sponsors for the podcast, Swiffer. If you want to sponsor me, I use your stuff all the time, Swiffer. It's great. I have hardwood floors and they're magical. <laughs> The other name is like, I think they're the other broom he had was the shooting star or something. Like every other broom that's not the firebolt has a terrible name. Very big it's disparity. Just... The Quidditch team is very excited about this. And then the last thing that happens. So Ron is like, oh, Harry, I'll put the firebolt back in your room. I'm about to put the, the healing oil that they got from the shop for scabbers. And when he goes up. He comes back down and Ron's like super pissed and everyone's like, what's going on? He says that there was like a pile of blood and Scabbers is gone and he comes with a clump of hair that is from Crookshanks. So basically, Ron is led to believe that Crookshanks like ate and or mauled or something to Scabbers. He mutilated this rat. Yeah. And whose name is Scabbers, which is just gross. Yeah, pretty gross name for Peter Pettigrew. I mean, your rat. And that <laughs> is the end of chapter 12, which brings us to the end of this episode. But Ashley, thank you so much for being a part of this. This was super fun. A really good episode. Hey, anytime. I love Harry Potter. I love it less now that you've ruined it for me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And now I don't know wizards and I think they're characters. Assholes, so it's fine. <laughs> Take away all the food in my life, shoes. Oh, well, I'm sorry that it made your life significantly worse, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for being a part of the episode. This was a really good time. Everyone listening, if you want to follow Ashley on the internet, it's Ashley Strongarm on all the stuff. You know, you got your Vine and your Instagram and Twitter and all that. And then she's part of a band uh, called Deer Ears, D E A R Ears, yeah. uh, and they're made up of some lovely Vine humans. And your guys' music videos are yeah. super killer. So everyone, check out Deer Ears. That's great and everyone that listened thank you so much for for tuning in and ashley thank you so much for joining this has been really fun yeah, thank you for having me this is really awesome and yeah everybody you should definitely follow this yay this All is right. awesome oh you're too kind <laughs> Potterless is created by Mike Schubert, it is edited by Mike Schubert, it is hosted by Mike Schubert, it is produced by Mike Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. Thanks all for listening to this episode of Potterless. If you want to follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud, you can subscribe to us there. We're also on Stitcher, and I'm assuming some other apps. You can also follow us on Twitter at PotterlessPod. You can check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Potterless. And just thanks for everything, guys. I'm really excited about the direction in which Potterless is going, and you're all lovely people. So thank you so much, and until next time, as they say in Hogwarts, wizard on! Wizard on!